Hello and thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight. I'm Nick Blumberg. Brandis Friedman has the evening off. Here's what we're looking at. Our Spotlight Politics team on the growing divide between the city's top cop and the agency investigating police misconduct. And by fun, we mean lawns and trees blanketed with cicadas screaming at the tops of their lungs. That's right, the invasion of the cicadas is coming soon to a lawn near you. We have the story in our series, WTTW News Explains. Wait, what's that? And from ghosts to UFOs, a new WTTW special tracks down Chicago mysteries. And now to some of today's top stories. A top aide to embattled Dalton Mayor Tiffany Henyard is facing federal charges. Prosecutors say Village Administrator Keith Freeman committed bankruptcy fraud, underreporting income from the Village of Dalton, from Thornton Township, where he serves as manager, and from a consulting business. The U.S. Attorney's Office says the indictment is part of an ongoing investigation. Henyard's faced claims including corruption, wrongful termination, and retaliation. Former Chicago Mayor, Mayor Lord Lori Lightfoot is leading an investigation into Henyard. Freeman's bankruptcy fraud charges carry a sentence of up to five years. A new effort to aid violent crime victims. The Chicago police and community leaders announced an emergency assistance center in the back of the yards. It'll run from 3 to 7 p.m. tomorrow at Richard J. Daly Academy and offer aid to Chicagoans affected by violence, including the mass shooting just days ago that left nine-year-old Ariana Molina dead. Organizations including Chicago Survivors, UCAN, Metropolitan Family Services, and the Back of the Nar Yards Neighborhood Council will be on site to connect people with services and resources to help in their recovery. You do not need a police report in order to get these services. All of these services are free. The goal here is to start that journey of healing. Pro-Gaza activists say Chicago police broke up a peaceful demonstration without warning, with three marchers now facing criminal charges. The Chicago Coalition for Justice in Palestine took to downtown streets yesterday, protesting U.S. funding of Israel amid its war in Gaza. A spokesman says the protests are needed to call attention to thousands of civilian deaths in Gaza. We're going to keep doing that. That is our strategy. We need to escalate because if we don't escalate, this genocide won't stop. And we can't continue to just watch our people being killed, any people being killed, like they're being killed right now without doing anything about it. In a statement, CPD says officers only made arrests after the protest deviated from its planned route and marchers refused orders to disperse and illegally blocked traffic. Police say a, a protester was charged with two felonies, aggravated battery to an officer and resisting arrest. Two others face misdemeanor counts of resisting arrest and battery. Charges are still pending against two others. Advocates say anti-Semitic incidents in Illinois rose dramatically in 2023, 74% higher than the record previously set in 2022. The Anti-Defamation League's audit of anti-Semitic incidents found 211 cases around the state last year, 155 were harassment, 54 were anti-Semitic vandalism, and two were cases of assault. 68% of the total number of anti-Semitic incidents ADL recorded in Illinois last year occurred after Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. To provide added context, 20% more anti-Semitic incidents were reported between October 7th and December 31st than were reported in all of 2022. Up next, Chicago's top cops has an oversight agency stepped out of line. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Alexandra and John Nichols family, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors.
Signs of tension between the head of the Chicago Police Department and the agency that investigates officer misconduct. Meanwhile, Mayor Brandon Johnson's ambitious bond plan hits a roadblock in city council and travelers hit an actual roadblock as pro-Palestinian protesters shut down the highway entrance to O'Hare. Here with all that and more is our Spotlight Politics team, Amanda Vinicky and Heather Sharon. Good to see you both. Let's get started with the latest in the March police killing of 26-year-old Dexter Reed. Superintendent Larry Snelling had stayed relatively quiet until Friday when he called out the head of the Civilian Office of Police Accountability. Heather, what was the superintendent upset about? Well, he said they had acted irresponsibly, and most of his complaints seemed to center on the fact that WTTW News and other news organizations obtained a letter through the Freedom of Information Act request that detailed while Chief, why Chief Administrator Andrea Kirsten thought that the officers involved in the shooting should be stripped of their police powers until the probe is completed. In that letter, she also questioned whether the stop was truly prompted by a missing seatbelt, which is what the officers told investigators who responded to the scene of Reed's death. So all of those documents are public record. Kirsten did not sort of have any sort of discretion about whether to release those, but I think it is an indication that this is a perhaps new superintendent now for the first time facing the white hot spotlight after a truly sort of really breathtaking incident of violence on Chicago's west side. Yeah, absolutely. You know, stopped for uh, allegedly not wearing a seatbelt, but with some pretty darkly tinted windows that would make it tough for officers to see. You know, this is the latest crack in the relationship between police and COPA. Snelling's gone as far to say that the agencies treated officers so poorly they might contemplate suicide. Does this latest rift, Heather, demonstrate just how intractable an issue police accountability continues to be? Yes, even under the best of circumstances, the Chicago Police Department has shown a repeated inability to hold officers not accountable for misconduct. That is why the department is under a consent decree. That is why there is various layers of accountability. And it is difficult, especially when emotions are so fraught and there's so much pain and anger in the community to sort of make the system that has some real problems work as it should. You know, Amanda, we heard from Mayor Johnson who says transparency is so key in cases like this. This video certainly was released far quicker than previous police shootings. I mean, we saw going back to Laquan McDonald, it can take court action sometimes. But is transparency enough to appease folks who are calling for really wholesale police reform? No, it is not enough. I mean, I think that it has helped. You're not seeing massive riots in the streets. It certainly is a step and that is a step that frankly I think um, is not just on the side of those who are calling for changes at the CPD but also officers um, showing their side their their cameras um, an officer was shot of course as well as Johnson pointed out but no is this enough to satisfy those concerns certainly not as Heather noted you still have an ongoing consent decree and one that the CPD is behind in complying with this also has really raised the tenor on questions about what stops such as this, whether or not it was for a seatbelt violation, whether there should be stops being made in a city like Chicago with this sort of crimes, uh, these are known as pretextual stops, whether they should be happening. Right. Is a, is a not wearing a seatbelt or a broken taillight enough to endanger the life of someone being stopped? And as we saw with the officer being shot of, of folks on the force, uh, let's take a look at uh, some of the issues before city council. There was some drama in the finance committee yesterday, as there's been known to be. Uh, Heather, what's the latest on this pretty ambitious bond plan the mayor's put forward? Well, there seems to be one major sticking point, which is the threshold for projects to require separate city council approval. The current proposal sets that threshold at five million dollars, which is a relatively tight requirement. The city council routinely only ap approves projects of this kind that are more than $10 million. So this is a significant amount more of oversight prompted by concerns from members of the city council that they wanted to have greater say about how this borrowed money is used. However, that's not good enough for, for some members of the city council. They want to see that threshold dropped to $1 million. That's what they're going to fight out tomorrow in a reconvened meeting of the finance committee. If they figure it out, the full city council could vote on it just a couple hours later. But that's a big if, as yes. it usually is.
Uh, the mayor did have a request that uh, made it out of committee successfully yesterday. This is for 70 million additional dollars to fund services for migrants coming to Chicago. That passed 28, uh, 20 to 8, rather, and it's headed to a full vote tomorrow. But Amanda, it did take some arm twisting, you know, with the county and the state putting forward money. Uh, you know, is the mayor going to have egg on his face if this doesn't clear the, the council? I'm not sure that that is a problem that he is going to have to face. But yeah, I, I think it would present an issue. First of all, um, let's set aside the politics for a moment. The expectation is that more migrants will be coming. So there's just a practical issue of what would happen without those dollars in because this is the figure that the state, county and Chicago's leaders have agreed upon as carrying through, they believe, at least the end of calendar year 2024. So what then? But of course, yes, it would be, I think, egg on the mayor's face somewhat. Um, and frankly, that of Tony Preckwinkle, who was doing a lot of that arm twisting. She, of course, is not just the chair of the Cook County Board, but she's also uh, head of the Democratic Party for the county. So that's where you saw both her and I, I think publicly Pritzker saying this money needs to come forward. Yeah, and you know, we saw the, the idea here may have been to try and pressure the federal government to put forward more money by shortchanging it at the city side. And that doesn't seem to have worked out no, so well. No, I don't think that the, the federal government has plenty going on. I'm not sure that they really care. One would, <laughs> however, think that uh, President Biden would have his eyes on what is happening in Chicago a bit because he wants his re-election to go as smoothly as possible, and that is what the DNC is all about. Well, and speaking of the DNC, we heard about yesterday's Gaza protest downtown. There was also that huge bro uh, protest blocking the highway into O'Hare, uh, coordinated protest blocking Golden Gate Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge, other places around the country. Heather, how worried are the governor and the mayor and certainly folks at the national level about disruptions like this around the Democratic National Convention. They are very concerned because the shadow of what happened in 1968 looms very large here in Chicago and they want to sort of portray Chicago at its best. So they have a very fine line that they have to walk between protecting people's First Amendment rights and sort of making sure that protests don't get out of control. We're going to learn more about what those plans will entail later this week. The city is due to defend its policy for mass arrests in court. The coalition behind the consent decree that we just mentioned says it is in violation of the First Amendment and violates that court order. So more to come on this. The governor also made some headlines this week with a big change to the state's uh, parole board. This comes after the tragic killing uh, a little more than a month ago of 11-year-old Jaden Perkins by a parolee just a day after he was released. Amanda, who's the governor bringing in? I don't know him. I don't expect that many from Illinois do. An individual named James Montgomery Jr. He had worked in an administrative capacity in Massachusetts as sheriff's office and other administrative roles previously in that state. So he's coming in and really he is not going to have a vote on these parole cases. So I think that is crucial to point out what he is charged with is doing is taking some of the matters off of the board's hands so the people who do take up those cases will have more time and opportunity to focus focus on them, something that the governor has blamed the individual that was really responsible for hearing this case for not doing enough of. Well, certainly something that a lot of people are going to be watching with interest, and I know the two of you will as well. Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharon, thank you both. Up next, what's the buzz? We've got the scoop on some noisy neighbors that are about to emerge. Last week, the solar eclipse captivated the country, but it came and went in just a few hours. Next month, another natural phenomenon is set to happen, and it will last for weeks. The buzz about this rare natural event is sure to grow as we approach its expected mid-May arrival. Here's Patty Wetley with the latest edition of WTTW News Explains. It's time to stock up on earplugs, folks, because things are about to get loud. In case you hadn't heard, the cicadas are coming. We said the cicadas are coming! Now, maybe you're wondering, what's the big deal? We get cicadas every year. 
It's true that annual cicadas, also known as dog days cicadas, turn up every July or August just to remind us that summer's almost over. But there's another kind of cicada called periodical cicadas. They're more like reclusive rock stars. They disappear underground for years, living off of tree roots, and then emerge topside to loads of media hype. They even have the bloodshot eyes to complete the look. These periodical cicadas are grouped into 15 different broods scattered across the eastern U.S. Each brood has a different alarm clock of sorts set on either a 13-year or 17-year cycle. When the alarm goes off, the entire brood busts out of hiding so they can hurry up and mate and die. So what's the buzz in 2024? This spring, two different broods in Illinois are getting their wake-up call at the same time. A 13-year brood in southern Illinois and a 17-year brood in northern Illinois will make their first joint appearance in more than 200 years. The last time this happened, Illinois wasn't even a state. Before you picture skies darkened with trillions of insects, don't worry. The broods don't really overlap geographically. And places where the ground has been disturbed a lot over the years, like Chicago, will miss out on most of the fun. And by fun, we mean lawns and trees blanketed with cicadas screaming at the tops of their lungs. Actually, all that noise comes from male cicadas doing a serious core workout. They have a special body part that they vibrate by contracting tiny muscles hundreds of times a second. Then they use their abdomen like an amp, cranking up the sound to lawnmower levels on the decibel chart. Believe it or not, this ear-splitting racket is the fella's mating song, and lady cicadas dig it. One thing leads to another, and the next thing you know, a new generation of baby cicadas hatches, burrows underground, and the whole cycle starts all over again. See you in 2041! You can watch this and other animations in our Emmy Award winning series WTTW News Explains on our website where we also have a lot more information about the invasion of the cicadas. Okay, we've unlocked the mysteries of the cicada invasion. Up next, Jeffrey Bear is here to preview his latest program, uncovering some other great Chicago mysteries. Stay with us. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Did a UFO really fly over O'Hare Airport? Is Hull House haunted? And why don't Chicagoans put ketchup on their hot dogs? Well, Detective Jeffrey Bear sets out to try and solve these puzzlers in the new WTTW special, Chicago Mysteries, that's premiering tonight. Here's a look. Everyone loves a good mystery, and Chicago has enough of them to fill a library. Oh. I'm Jeffrey Bear. Let's see if we can solve some of Chicago's most perplexing mysteries. Anybody here that wants to communicate? Where did this thing come from? Whoa! Why? I solved the mystery! This is pretty much a dead end right here. I don't like you using the word dead. And joining us now with more is the program's host, co-writer, and producer, Jeffrey Bear. Jeffrey, good to see you. And the producer is Sean Keenahan. Darn so right. Did a great job. And we're happy to have him with us. Okay, before we get into how the show came about, did we just see a giant potato in that clip? <laughs> Well, it looked like a giant potato. It was actually a vessel that, okay. with, that with someone attempted to roll across Lake Michigan in this wind-powered vessel. It was part of a my favorite story in the show, which is about the Fool Killer, which is this supposed submarine that was found uh, on the bottom of the Chicago River in 1915. So the Fool Killer is on the right there, the uh, the submarine vessel. Uh, this was uh, discovered by a sort of uh, self-promoting deep sea diver there named William Frenchy Deneau, uh -huh. who stubbed his toe on this thing, and it was, I don't know, maritime law. They said he could keep it. <laughs> so he put it on display in a skee-ball arcade. This is the fellow we in interview about this. 
Mark Chrysler, a podcaster. He put it on display in a skee-ball arcade, and you could you could go inside for 10 cents if you dare. Okay. I love that maritime law boils down to finders keepers, yeah. essentially. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, Chicago's got a history of mysteries, like many mm -hmm. old cities. Mm -hmm. How'd you pick which ones to investigate for this program? Well, you know, it, we wanted a range of mysteries, so there's, you know, true crime, there's the paranormal in, in the show, there I am ghost hunting, we have got the UFO in the show over O'Hare. Um, and then, you know, there was also, as we worked on it more and more, um, we realized there's this element of fun. So, yeah, there's a, there's a murder that happened, but it was 100 years ago. And, and so we really didn't put anything like too modern day or too grim in the show. Uh, and we really kind of sort of leaned into the fun. It's the most fun show I've ever done. I love that. Well, speaking of that 100-year-old murder mystery, not mm -hmm. to be too bleak, but this is known as the Lutgert Sausage Vat Murder. Uh, yeah. Leads into a sort of a ghost hunt. Let's take a look at a clip. So this actually has a temperature probe right here. We could encounter what's called a cold spot. He says they could help us track down evidence of Louisa's spirit. That is the actual detection device. An EM vortex, sometimes called EM pumps, we're kind of feeding the ghost. Look at that thing. We've actually had some of these devices go off on command. Once we were fully equipped, OK, let's do it. We canvassed the premises. It just said here. Anybody here that wants to communicate? All right, Jeffrey, where is that that you were trying to track down a ghost, and why did that seem like a good idea? Yeah, well, actually, we were the only camera crew that's ever been allowed in there. Um, okay. This is now, we're not allowed to disclose the location out of uh, privacy, but it, it's now a condo building wow. um, on, uh, in the Lakeview neighborhood. And, but it, in, the, in the 1890s, it was a sausage factory, and um, this, the Chicago Sausage King uh, was accused of murdering his wife and uh, disposing of her body in a rather grim manner uh, in the basement of this uh, saucer. It's not a Sweeney Todd story. Okay. I want to make that clear. Duly noted. Uh, but it was, and it was, you know, the trial of the century. It was a big three ring circus, and he was eventually uh, convicted. Okay. Well, there's a segment that hits very uh, close to home for you. This dates mm -hmm. back, uh, predating the city of Chicago's founding, back when this was land occupied by indigenous Americans. Can right. you tell us? more about that. Yeah, this is indigenous land that we all live on that was acquired by the United States government on less than honorable means. Um, and so when I was growing up in North Suburban Deerfield, there was this tree in a little woodland like a block from my house and it was uh, a tree that was bent over and this is how the Native Americans did this. These were called uh, trail marker trees. So now hundreds of years later it grows up to look like something like this and it's a clue that Native Americans you know, lived there. They used these bent trees to mark their trails. And then we go on in the show to explain that many of the diagonal streets in Chicago are the living reminders that we um, now have. Uh, th th these are former Indian trails. These were the first roads in Chicago, which have since been overlaid by the famous Chicago street grid. Very cool. Well, some of the mysteries are far more recent than that, uh, including an alligator that was found in Humboldt Park, came to affectionately be known as Chance the Snapper. Indeed. Were you able to figure out just how he made his way into that lagoon? Well, so I love the fact that some of these mysteries are not solved. Um, yet one of the clues to how he got there, this is the photographer who first spotted Chance the Snapper. She was shooting a quinceanera uh, <laughs> uh, photo shoot, and she, they, she spotted something in the water and, and didn't see know what it was, and then she zoomed zoomed in and she was like, wow, it's an alligator. And then Mina Bloom here from uh, Black Club broke the story. So the, the clue about who he was, Chance, uh, is that he had a bent snout. And that suggests that he was caged. And as he grew big, finally his nose was pressed up against the cage. And so whoever owned him as an illegal pet likely dumped him. And there he is. I thought he was going to be this big guy, but when they rescued him, he was this cute little guy. But then here's Alligator Rob who rescued him, and we, we interview him down in Florida now, and that's Chance today. He's, wow. He's six, more than six feet long, so he's living a happy life he's down in Florida. He's eating well. Good for yeah. him. <laughs> okay, I think I also spied a uh, recently retired but still much loved yes. WGN meteorologist Tom Skilling. Is this a weather mystery? Well, no, although tonight would be a good night for a weather <laughs> mystery. Um, Tom's probably at home going, oh, I wish I could get back on yeah, TV. Right. 
But uh, this, well, there was a UFO that was spotted uh, at O'Hare, and this is not some crackpot who spotted it. This is John Hilkovich, the journalist from the Tribune. Uh, he got the air traffic control traits. The controllers are talking about this. They're on the air traffic control. They say, did you guys see a UFO? Yeah, we thought we saw a flying disc. So they claimed that, uh, the FAA claimed that it was this, that it was a hole punch cloud. So who better to solve that mystery and tell us what a hole punch cloud is than Tom Skilling. So I was very thrilled to get to meet Tom Skilling and ask him if, if there's anything to this hole punch cloud thing. If there's anybody who's going to know, it's going to be it, Tom. Oh, and believe me, he knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeffrey, I cannot wait to check out all the rest of these and all that is uh, left on the website as well. I know there's much more to check out there as well. Absolutely. The website is loaded with extra content, including four more mysteries that are not featured in the show. So, Fantastic. 7 o'clock tonight all on right. WTTW and WTTW.com. All right. Jeffrey Bear, thank you so much. My pleasure. And as we just mentioned, more baffling tales await you at WTTW.com slash Chicago Mysteries. And as Jeffrey just said, don't forget to check out the premiere of Chicago Mysteries tonight at 7 on WTTW. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And join us tomorrow night at 5.30 and 10 for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. City Council members debate an additional $70 million to fund migrant services and a new book about the unraveling of America's suburbs, including Evanston. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. Thank you for watching, stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to be a multilingual law firm that provides translators for a variety of languages.